Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we will discuss the articles displayed on the screen from the daily edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 14th May 2019. So let us start our discussion. Now in today's newspaper, there are few news snippets which can be important for us from the preliminary examination point of view. So first let us take them one by one. So in this line, the first snippet is on page number 4 and it is related to an invasive species known as water hyacinth and it is impacting the Mula River in the city of Pune. So this will be a part of the preliminary examination under the topic general issues on environment and ecology. Now if you go through the previous year papers, in the year 2018 there was a question related to a species known as Prosopis juliflora and this is also an invasive species and the correct answer here was that it tends to reduce the biodiversity in the area in which it grows. So let us understand some facts related to water hyacinth and the location of Mula River. Now if you go through the biology NCRT of class 12th, in the chapter number 16 it talks about various environmental issues and in particular it talks about the impact of discharge of domestic sewage into the water bodies. So let us look at the impact of discharge of domestic sewage into the water bodies. Now in this regard it says that the domestic sewage and industrial effluents contain various impurities which are added to the water bodies. And these include suspended solids, for example, sand, silt and clay, colloidal material, which include the fecal material, bacteria, cloth and paper fibers. And finally, it also has dissolved materials, which include nutrients like nitrate, ammonia, phosphate, sodium and calcium. So these are the pollutants which are generated into water bodies due to the discharge of domestic sewage and industrial effluents. Now further, when the domestic sewage is discharged into the water bodies, the bacteria present in the water body try to degrade that degradable material which is discharged into the bodies. Now as these bacteria are consuming the biodegradable material, they require high amount of oxygen. So by calculating the biological oxygen demand, it can be ascertained as to how much domestic waste is present in a body. This is because the bacteria are consuming the biodegradable material using the oxygen. Now what happens is that at the point of sewage discharge, the demand for oxygen increases. So as can be seen in this diagram, at the point of sewage discharge, the dissolved oxygen decreases. As can be seen by this red line, it shows that there is a severe decline in the dissolved oxygen at the point of sewage. This is because the bacteria is consuming the present oxygen in the water. However, the biological oxygen demand increases. This is because the bacteria want oxygen and their demand for oxygen is increasing. So that is shown by this blue line. However, as one moves away from the civil discharge point, the things start normalizing again and the dissolved oxygen again increases and the biological oxygen demand decreases. So it shows that at the point of civil discharge, there will be killing of fishes and disappearance of clean water organisms. However, as one moves away from the civil discharge point, there will be reappearance of the clean water organisms. So what you should understand is that at the point of sewage discharge, the dissolved oxygen decreases as can be seen by this red line and the biological oxygen demand increases. And why this happens? This is because the bacteria require oxygen to degrade the biodegradable material that is discharged into the water bodies. And previously a question has also been asked related to the biological oxygen demand in the preliminary examination. Further, as the nutrient discharge is increased into the water bodies and nutrients like the nitrates and the phosphates are released into the water bodies, it leads to the increase of growth of planktonic algae, which are free floating in nature. And such phenomena has been named as algal bloom. And this makes the water bodies colored and it provides a distinct color to the water bodies. And these algal blooms have been related to the deterioration of the water quality and high fish mortality in the water bodies. And some of these algae are also toxic to human beings and other animals. Now besides increasing the algal bloom, the discharge of nutrients into the water bodies leads to the growth of invasive species if they are introduced in the first place. And regarding these invasive species, this chapter talks about one of the very important invasive species which is known as water hyacinth. So here you should also learn about the scientific name of this invasive species and it is named as Icornia crassipus. And this is the world's most problematic aquatic weed. 
so as you have seen in the picture in the news article it also talks about this water hyacinth which is an invasive species and its population increases because of discharge of nutrients into the water bodies and also due to the growth of invasive species if they are introduced in the first place and this water hyacinth has been named as terror of bengal and as shown further these grow abundantly in eutrophic water bodies which means that in those water bodies where the nutrient discharge is so high that it leads to the growth of plants and ultimately it leads to the death of the water bodies in which case these water bodies start drying up so similarly it talks about various other phenomena for example it talks about a phenomena known as biomagnification and this refers to the increase in concentration of toxicant at successive trophic levels which can be seen in this diagram this happens because the toxic substances get accumulated in the organism and why does it get accumulated this is because it cannot be metabolized or excreted by that animal a particular example of this is the ddt and the concentration of ddt in the animals keeps on increasing as one moves from the lower trophic levels to the higher trophic levels so the concentration is higher in small fishes as compared to the zooplanktons now what is the impact of such biomagnification so you can see it here that the high concentration of ddt disturbs the calcium metabolism in birds and this causes thinning of the eggshell and premature breaking and eventually decline in the bird populations so this can also be a very important fact for us from the preliminary examination point of view further this chapter talks about a phenomena known as eutrophication and which is known as the natural aging of a lake by nutrient enrichment of its water which means that due to the addition of nutrients in the water bodies the lakes or water bodies start aging so as it explains further with time the streams draining into the lake introduce nutrients such as nitrogen and the phosphorus and these nutrients encourage the growth of aquatic organisms and due to the growth of these aquatic animals like plants and animals over the centuries as silt and organic debris pile up the lake grows shallower and warmer and finally it converts into marsh and eventually the lake dries up and converts into a land now one of the phenomena is natural aging which is known as natural eutrophication however when the human induced eutrophication takes place it is known as cultural or accelerated eutrophication so this means that due to the addition of pollutants and nutrients we are increasing the rate of eutrophication which means that we are increasing the aging process of the water bodies and as you can see in the year 2018 there was a question in the preliminary examination which read that the size of a lake has reduced drastically in the past few years so that can happen because of eutrophication and this process can also be accelerated because of the phenomena known as climate change so in that case the example was of aral sea further in the present year another lake has been in news which is known as the lake aculeo and this lake is from chile and this has also dried up in past 10 years because of eutrophication and climate change further this chapter also explains about another important pollutant in the water bodies and these pollutants are known as heated waste waters or thermal water now this thermal waste water eliminates or reduces the number of organisms which are sensitive to high temperature and this leads to the enhanced growth of plants and fishes in extremely cold areas and this causes the death of indigenous flora and fauna So to further understand the details of various environmental issues you should go through this chapter of biology of class 12th and as provided in this news article it talks about water hyacinth and you should know the scientific name of this invasive species and this is a problematic aquatic weed and is also known as terror of bengal and regarding the mula river you should note that it is a important river of the city pune now similarly you should note that another important river is known as musi and this river passes through the city hyderabad so this can also be a one important fact so in this article we have learned about the various problems that are caused due to the discharge of domestic sewage into the water bodies and particularly we have looked about the invasive species known as water hyacinth and its scientific name so with this let's move to the next article now this article on page number 5 talks about the isro's program in which it has hosted the first batch of teen scientists and this can be important aspect for us from the preliminary examination point of view 
So in this it talks about an initiative known as the UVCA. Now similarly in the year 2016 there was a question related to another important initiative of the government of India which was known as the Swayam and it talked about the aim of the Swayam initiative. So the aim of this swam was to provide affordable and quality education to the citizens for free. So if you look at the options that were provided in this questions, all of them were looking very close. And if you don't have any idea about the swam portal, you will not be able to answer such questions. So these are factual questions and you should have the knowledge of all such initiatives. So similarly, you should note the basic aim of the UVCA program and which agency has started this program. So let us learn about this. So regarding UVICA, you should note that it is an initiative of the Indian Space Research Organization or ISRO. And this is also called as the Young Scientist Program or the Yuva Vigyani Karikram. And that is why it is known as UVICA. And it was launched in March 2019 only. And that is why it becomes very important for us from the preliminary examination. Now what is the basic aim of this UVICA program of ISRO? So the program is primarily aimed at imparting basic knowledge on space technology, space science and space applications, especially to the younger ones with the intent of arousing their interest in the emerging areas of space activities. And it also focuses on inculcating scientific temper in the students apart from contributing to national integration and national. And as you would be knowing, Inculcation of scientific temper is one of the fundamental duties in the Indian constitution in the part 4a and the ISRO has started this program to catch the young students from the school and inculcate in them the scientific temper so that their interest in the scientific programs of India starts arising. Now this is a two week residential training program to learn about the national space program and in this three students each are selected from each state and union territory. And it includes those students who have just passed the class 9th examination and are about to enter the class 10th. So although these facts are not important, what is important is that it is an initiative of ISRO and it aims at inculcating scientific temper in the students. And these two aspects can be very important for us from the preliminary examination point of view. So you should keep all these points in mind. And this can be also important for us for the upcoming preliminary examination. So with this, let's move to the next article. Now this article on page number 5 is related to a festival which is celebrated in the state of Kerala and this is known as the Thrissur Puram. So this will form a part of the preliminary examination syllabus under the topic history of India and art and culture. So let us take up few facts which are related to this festival. So regarding the Thrissur Puram you should note that it is an annual festival and is held in the state of Kerala. Further it is held at the Vadakkunathan temple which is located in Thrissur. And it is called Puram because it is celebrated on the Puram day which is the day when the full moon rises with the Puram star in the Malayalam calendar month of Medam. Regarding the Vadakku Nathan temple you should note that it is an ancient Hindu temple and is dedicated to Lord Shiva. Further let us take up some more important facts related to this Vadakku Nathan temple. Now this Vadakku Nathan temple is an example of the architectural style of Kerala. And regarding the architectural style of Kerala you should note that it is a bit different from the Dravidian style of temples which are prevalent in South India. Now this is because it is influenced by both the Dravidian as well as the Vedic Vastu Shastra. And that is why it is unique in nature. Further this temple is famous for its mural paintings and which depict various episodes from the Mahabharata. However the main deity of this temple is Lord Shiva and he is worshipped in the form of a huge lingam. Now this temple is also famous for some of the theatre forms and the temple theatre where these arts are performed is known as Kuthambalam and the different theatre arts are Kuthu, Nangyar and Kuriyattam. Further one important ritual that is associated with this temple and the Thirusulpuram festival is the Vilambaram ritual and in this ritual the elephants carry the idol of Naithalaka Vilamma and they will open the Gopuram Nara, Thekke Gopuram Nara or the main gate of this temple. So this is one of the rituals that is involved in this festival. Now after this let us understand some key facts related to Kuriyattam which is an important art form for us from the preliminary examination point of view. So regarding Kuriyattam you should note that it is a traditional performing art or theatre art in the state of Kerala. And it is a combination of ancient Sanskrit theatre with elements of Kuthu 
which is a Tamilian or Malayanan performing art which is as old as Sangam era. So it is a mix of both these art forms. And the most important fact related to Kuriyattam is that it is officially recognized by UNESCO as a masterpiece of oral and intangible heritage of humanity. So this can be an important fact for us from the preliminary examination point of view. So you should keep all these points in mind. And with this, let's move to the next article. Now this article on page number seven is related to an upcoming initiative of the Ministry of Environment and Forest, which is related to the DNA databasing of the Indian rhinoceros. So this will form a part of the preliminary examination syllabus under the topic general issues on environment and ecology. Now this program is yet to start. However, let us look at some of the proposed ideas in this article. Now regarding the DNA profiling of the rhinoceros, the environment ministry has proposed on a project to create the DNA profiles of all rhinoceros in the country. And if this project starts, by 2021, the Indian rhinoceros could be the first wild animal species in India to have all its members DNA sequenced. And this project has been proposed by the World Wildlife Fund or the WWF India and the Wildlife Institute of India. So this program is yet to start. However, it has been proposed by the WWF and the WII. Regarding the World Wildlife Fund, it is an international non-governmental organization and was founded in the year 1961 and it is working in the field of wilderness preservation, etc. So you should note that the WWF is not a part of UN. Secondly, regarding the Wildlife Institute of India, it is an autonomous institution under the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change. And it conducts specialized research in areas of study like endangered species, biodiversity, etc. So this is a news in transition. However, we should know about the WWF and the Wildlife Institute of India. And if this project starts by 2021, the Indian rhino will be the first animal to be DNA sequenced in the wild. So with this, let's move to the next article. Now this article on page number eight talks about the recent issue of Rafael pricing formula and the report of CAG, which it has submitted to the president. So in this article, the author has raised issues regarding the reductive pricing, which has been used by CAG in its report to the president. So this will form a part of the mains examination syllabus under the topic governance and polity. So let us look at some of the points which have been highlighted by the author regarding the CAG's report in the Rafael deal. Now first let us look at the context of the issue. So recently the CAG submitted an audit report to the president of India under the article 151. And this report was related to the pricing issue of the Rafael jets. And in this report, the CAG used the concept of redactive pricing. Now, what is this redactive pricing? Now, the reduction is the selection or adoption by removing sensitive information from a document under publication. So, reduction means removing of sensitive information from a document which is to be published now. So, under the redactive pricing method, CAG had withheld full commercial details and had blackened the figures on procurement deal on the security concerns cited by the ministry. So under the reductive pricing in the Rafael Jets deal, the CAG withheld the full commercial details of this deal and it also did not provide figures on the procurement deal. And this was done at the behest of Ministry of Defense, which had cited the security concerns. Now this issue of reductive pricing in the CAG report raises two issues. First is, whether the CAG is right in accepting the ministry's concerns and thereby acting on such concerns by withholding important information in the audit report, which is to be submitted to the president under Article 151. So is the CAG right in withholding some of the information? And the second is, did the Comptroller and Auditor General violate the constitutional norms by accepting the ministry's concern? So does it have this mandate of accepting any ministry's concern while conducting an audit. Now these are precisely the two questions in front of the Supreme Court. And it is for the Supreme Court to decide regarding the CAG's duties and whether it was correct or right in using the reductive pricing method. Now although the matter is in front of Supreme Court, let us understand what could be the adverse impact of withholding such an information by the CAG. Now, as we all know that under the Article 151 of the Indian Constitution, 
it provides that the CAG of India will submit reports to the president and the president will cause them to be laid before each house of the parliament. So if the CAG does not submit the complete report, then such information which is withheld will never be available for legislative scrutiny for the members of parliament, which means that important informations will not be available to the parliamentary scrutiny, which is at the base of our democratic system. Now, as complete information has not been provided to the parliament, it will also not be available to parliamentary committees and media. And this is because of the reductive pricing audit, which has been used by the CAG in the Rafael deal. Now, as the CAG has withheld the information regarding the pricing of the procurement decision under the Rafael deal in its report to the president, let us understand the importance of pricing in any government's procurement decision, which has been highlighted by the author. Now, pricing is an important part of any procurement decision of government because it helps in ascertaining the quality or the qualitative and the quantitative specifications, comparative merits and demerits of any deal. So it lets us understand about the various aspects of any decision, which can be qualitative or quantitative specifications. Further, the pricing of any commodity also helps us in knowing the conditions of sale purchase agreement its strategic advantage over the other products or services, the terms of deal, after-service conditions, discounts available, etc. And that is why the price integrity and comparative competitiveness are at the heart of any procurement decision-making process in any government deal. And by withholding such important information, the CAG is not providing the information to the parliament regarding various aspects of the Rafael deal. So in this regard, let us understand the views of author regarding the duties of CAG and specially particularly related to this audit report related to Rafael D. Now the author has highlighted that the pricing decisions must be subjected to detailed analysis without resorting to the reductive pricing method. And this is because the CAG's audit is expected to highlight value for money in any purchase decisions to the government. Secondly, such a use of the reductive pricing method reflects the lack of objective, independent and judicious audit opinion. And this is because the CAG is mandated to get into the nitty-gritty of procurement terms, procedures, comparative advantages and disadvantages without fear and favor. Further, by using the reductive pricing method, the CAG has also compromised the integrity of financial property and prudence of procurement decisions which has to be provided in the audits. And finally, the parliament is constitutionally privileged to know the details of any procurement deals which are made by the executive. And this information should include the condition and the circumstances of such procurements also. Therefore, any decision with respect to procurement by the executive needs to be audited independently by CAG, including the non-compliance of the essential procurement which is the main issue in the Rafael deal. So by using the reductive pricing method, the CAG has not highlighted the value for money issue in the government purchase. Secondly, it has shown the lack of objective, independent and judicious audit opinion. And it has also compromised the principles of financial propriety and prudence of procurement decision. And finally, it has compromised the parliament's privilege of knowing the details of any procurement process. And this is because the parliament can then hold the executive accountable. Now further, the author has provided the view on the performance audit and has also analyzed the question as to if the CAG is capable enough to perform the performance audit in India. So regarding the performance audit, the author says that such audits seek to establish at what cost and to what degree the programs, policies and projects are working. Further, it aims at ascertaining that if the things are being done in the right way or not. However, it goes further and finds out whether the right things are being done or not. So the performance audit makes sure that the procedures are being followed in any decision making. Further, it goes beyond the procedures and identifies if the government is exploiting any loophole or not. So in short, it also identifies as to right things are being done or not. And finally, the financial audit checks and the performance audit seeks to assess whether a program, scheme or activity deploys means to achieve its intended socio-economic objectives or not. So it ensures that the intended purpose of any project is being followed or not. However, according to the author, 
the CAG office lacks expertise, knowledge and skills to conduct a performance audit. This is because it is a complex exercise which requires exceptional insight into such an audit. Further, the CAG needs to work on incorporating such pool of resources from the credible organizations in the market which can help it in improving its performance regarding the performance audits of government projects. So these are few points which have been highlighted by the author in this article regarding the CAG's usage of redactive pricing method in its report regarding the Rafael deal and how this decision impacts the parliament etc. Now this article on page number 9 talks about the composition of election and the election commissioners. So previously the election commission was a single member body however presently it is a multi-member body. Now the various aspects regarding the election commission have been discussed in the DNS of 21st April 2019. So you can go through this video and understand the various aspects of the election commission and its independence. And if it is independent enough to play fairly. Now further this news article on page number 13 talks about the WTO reforms. And we have discussed the WTO reforms in detail in the Daily News Simplified of 17th February 2019. And you should note that in the year 2018, in the mains examination, there was a question related to the reform of WTO. And we have already discussed in detail this question. And in this DNS video, we have discussed the WTO reforms issue as it was asked in the year 2018's mains examination. With this, let's take up some practice questions. Now, after today's discussion, you should go through these practice questions and the answer for these questions will be displayed after five seconds. Now the first question reads, water hyacinth sometimes appears in news in the context of. So the correct answer here is that it is an invasive species found in water bodies. The second question reads, Uvica is an initiative of which of the following? So as we have learned today, it is an initiative of Indian Space Research Organization or ISRO. So the correct answer is C. Further, you should try both these questions and the answer will be displayed after five seconds. Now the first question reads, with reference to the Kuriyattam, consider the following statements. The first is that it is a traditional theatre art performed in Kerala, which is the correct statement. The second statement reads, it is recognized by UNESCO as a masterpiece of intangible heritage of humanity, which is also correct. So the correct answer here is C, both 1 and 2. And finally, the fourth question reads, World Wildlife Fund is an initiative of. So as we have learned, it is an independent organization and is not a part of any of the initiatives of United Nations. With this, we have come to the end of today's discussion. Now let's move on to the question for the day. 